begin from verse 18 of chapter 12 of Hebrews. Let us stir our hearts and hear the word of the Lord. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stone. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned, who warned them on earth, how much less will we, if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he promised, Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words, once more, indicate the removing of what cannot, what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming Fire. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honoured by all. And the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? It's a wonderful promise, isn't it? I will never leave you nor forsake you, says the Lord. Today, as we face the prospect of dramatic upheaval in our day-to-day -day lives, this is a promise to hold on to. It's a promise to live by. The Lord says to his people, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. You notice how it's, how it's prefaced? For he has said, he has said, the Lord has said, it's a, it's a promise that's found in various forms in the Bible and the Old Testament, and it's repeated here. God whose word is truth has said. God whose word never changes has said. That's enough to clinch the argument. If God has said it, then it stands, and no circumstance will change that. And so again, it's a reminder to us to make sure we know and apply the Word of God to our lives. Never means 2020 as much as at any time. 2020, the year of bushfires and floods and global pandemic and financial and economic meltdown. 2020, the Lord has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In fact, so forcefully is it said here that in the original uh, text of the language in which uh, the scripture is written, there are five negatives. 
in that verse, I will never, never leave you. Never, never, never forsake you. And if the Lord repeats himself five times, it means friends, we're meant to take notice. We're meant to take notice. So we're going to think about this promise. We'll think about the substance of the promise. What is this promise to us? We'll think about how that promise is applied in the scriptures and to our lives. And then we'll think of the, if we've got time, we'll think of the effect that it has, that it has upon us as well. Let's think of the substance of this promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Of course, what is implied in that is the fact that God is with us. The God who will never leave us is the God who is with us. And of course we know that we are never far away, never, never at any point away from the presence of God because He is always present everywhere with all of His being. God is everywhere present at all times. No God denier can hide from the presence of God because God is always everywhere. That's what the Psalm, Psalm 139 declares to us, of course. But there's another sense, a little wonderful sense in which God from whose presence we cannot hide, is actively with his people. That's what John puts so beautifully and dramatically in the introduction to his gospel in John 1 and verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became flesh and became one with us. This is God coming to be with us in order to be the saviour of his people. God with us in the fullness of His being. God who is almighty, who has framed this whole universe and holds all things together by the word of His power. God coming to be with us. God who is all-knowing. God from whom there are no secrets that are hidden. God who knows everything. God is with us with all of His being. With all of His being, He is with us always. And when Jesus returned to heaven, having accomplished the work that he came from heaven to do, he left his people with an assurance. He said, I am with you always to the end of the age. Which is a wonderful assurance of the fact that our Lord is with us. But what would it mean for him to leave us? Because we are told the Lord says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So therefore it must be something that comes into the minds and hearts of people at times. Has God left me? Has God forsaken me? What would it mean for God to leave us? Well, the alternative, of course, is that word forsaken. We would be forsaken. It's an awful word that means abandoned. It conjures the image of a, of a ghost town where people have gone perhaps in time past and they thought, we'll settle here. It's a lovely place and with all their dreams and, and aspirations, what they want to make of that place. And they, and they build homes to dwell in and, and buildings in which to work. And, and then... <coughs> The long-term weather returns to what it was before they went there and suddenly they find there's a drought and they can't possibly live there anymore and the town is abandoned, people move away and the buildings crumble and decay and all that's left is these crumbling buildings to show off the hopes and aspirations that had been there in people's minds in the past. Forsaken towns, forsaken buildings. But a forsaken town is nothing compared with a forsaken person. There are fair weather towns, yes, and there are fair weather friends as well. There are those who will abandon those who profess to be their friends when circumstances change. We can think of Job, the man who enjoyed good company until hard times came upon him. When he lost his wealth and he lost his health, then his friends abandoned him. His friends turned upon him as well. And how many stories are there like that among the homeless people of our society? Hard times come and no one wants to know them anymore. That's the impossible situation that the Lord is telling us about. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. God will never leave His people because He is so heavily invested in His people, we can say. The Lord Jesus Christ did not take flesh and dwell among us only in order to be a fair weather friend. He didn't go to the cross to suffer the wrath of God in our place only to abandon us. He didn't cry out to his father in his dying hours, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Only to forsake us when the times turn against us to leave us to our own devices. Because you see, that's what believers were facing when they received this letter to the Hebrews. That's one of the reasons why this letter is written. Here are the believers facing the beginning of a terrible time of persecution. The beginning of what was going to continue for almost 300 years of Roman persecutions of believers. 
The climate was changing, the social climate was changing. The long-term pattern, we might say, was reverting to the normal. What was going to happen? What was that going to mean? Is that going to mean that the Lord's people are abandoned? That they're going to be remembered perhaps as just an historical anomaly? Well, that was interesting for a time, but now they're gone and the Roman Empire continues as it was. No, that cannot be. Because here is the confident assertion of the believer. This is what Paul writes to us in Romans, that wonderful assuring chapter, Romans chapter 8, verses 31, 32. A reminder of the, of the presence of our God with us. Romans 8, 31. Want to get there? What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him us for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God did not spare his son. That's the great investment that God has in his people. Never. I will never leave you, he says. Never. Not in your days of trouble. Not in your days of doubt. Not in those days when you think everything is against you. He will never leave you. Not in your days of debt when it seems to be absolutely impossible for you to continue. He will never leave you. You can think of the Apostle Paul. He's writing to Timothy towards the end of his life and he's, he's in prison, he's on trial and he says to Timothy, all deserted me, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. The Lord stood by me and strengthened me. The Lord who knows what it means to be betrayed. The Lord who knows what it means to be deserted by all of his followers. He stood by Paul. And strengthen him in his trial. You see that the Lord is with us to strengthen us. That's the reason the Lord comes and makes his presence felt with us. To strengthen us, to encourage us. His long term purpose for us is that we should be with him in glory in heaven forever. That's why he came from heaven to earth. That's why he came to open up the way to be the trailblazer, to be the way to God. And nothing is going to prevent that. There is nothing that can take place between now and then that can prevent that. All oh, but it is a hard journey. There are dangers everywhere. Every step of the journey. Overconfidence is a danger just as much as fear is a danger. Pride is a danger just as much as persecution is a danger. We need the Lord's presence with us right now to strengthen us, to guide us, to warn us, to shield us, so that indeed we know that there is nothing in all creation that will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. It's a promise of grace that's given to the Lord's people. That's the substance of the promise. God has said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Well, let's think of how that promise is applied because we're meant to take the promises of God and put them into the circumstances we find ourselves in. God's promises are given to us that we live by them. So let's have a look at some of these he has said passages. Remember, we said here, uh, it is the Lord who has said that he will never leave us for us or forsake us. Well, where has he said that? Let's just think of some of the examples of that in the scriptures. This is the account what in Genesis chapter 28 and verse 15. Here is Jacob. Jacob, this one who has stolen his elder, his elder brother's birthright, Esau's birthright. He's cheated Esau again on another occasion. Because of that, facing the wrath of Esau, he has to flee for his life. And he's on the run, leaving home, going to where he, he doesn't know. He's sleeping rough at night under the stars with a stone for a pillow, and here in this place, far from home, unable to return home, with an unknown future ahead of him, full of anguish for the treachery, uh, what his treachery has brought him, here the Lord comes to him in a dream and gives him this assurance. Genesis 28 and verse 15. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. I will not leave you. And how that promise must have imprinted itself in Jacob's memory. When his father-in-law Laban cheated him later on, the Lord was with him and blessed him still. When he finally returned to his homeland, he had the fearful prospect of meeting up with Esau. What's going to happen here? Esau's been incubating his resentment for all these years. 
And that night before they met, the angel of the Lord comes to Jacob and strengthens him. And the next day, oh, what a bliss reunion it was. But still the struggle wasn't over in Jacob's life, of course. Later he suffers the loss of his sons. Joseph, he believes, has been killed by wild beasts. Simeon's in prison in Egypt. His youngest son, Benjamin, is dear son of his departed wife is to be sent to Egypt as a hostage as well. And Jacob concludes when he considers all of this, all this has come against me, he cries out. No, it hasn't, Jacob. I want to shout down through the corridors of time. It hasn't come against you. This is all working out better for you than you could possibly have imagined in your wildest dreams. The Lord promised Jacob he would be with him. And with him he was. So then, are you feeling overwhelmed by your troubles? Do you need assurance? Look to Jacob. Look to Jacob. Because if God can be with this man through all of his troubles and make him into the founder of the nation, make him into the father of the twelve, will be the founders of the twelve tribes of Israel. If he can do that for Jacob, he can bring you through your troubles. So there's a promise. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Think of Moses. Moses has been leading the people of Israel through those years that they're wandering in the wilderness as they're making their way finally into the promised land. And yet, of course, we know Moses is not to be able to go into the land. The people of Israel have come almost to the end of their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And now at the end of it, their leader, Moses, announces to them, that he can no longer be with them. The Lord had told him he was not to go into the promised land. And so here are the people with this massive challenge still ahead of them. A land possessed by enemies who are intent on harming them. And now Moses says they're going to have to face it without him. Yes, but not without the Lord. Not without the Lord. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And again in verse 8. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. And so when the spies' reports came back, the land is filled with giants. And here they are, a people who for 40 years have known nothing but desert wanderings. We're no match for this. What we need is strong leadership. If ever there's a time we needed strong leadership, this is it. And now we're going to be leadless. But not without the Lord. What are you facing this year? What's the biggest challenge you can see ahead of you? Because right now, the threat that's gathering the attention of the population of the whole world right now, the threat that's posed by this COVID-19 pandemic. We didn't see that coming three months ago. As we looked at the beginning of the year and thought, what's, what's in prospect? That wasn't remotely on the radar. That's a big threat for every one of us. And consequently, the changes that we've made you know, to the meeting this morning. But maybe you've got your own personal health issues. It's a challenge to see here. Maybe there's a family problem that's looming large and you don't know how to deal with that. Maybe there's a financial struggle. Certainly there's going to be a lot of financial hardship in the months and possibly years to come as a result of all of this. And then above all of that, there is the monumental task that's still before the church to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Do you need confidence? Look to the example of Moses encouraging the people of Israel. The Lord is with you. And then there's Joshua, the one who, is, who God has chosen to be the successor of Moses. Here he is, <clears throat> the one who will lead the people into the land. And when you look at the way the Lord commissions him and gives him the promise, you get the picture that he's fearful of what lies ahead. In Joshua <clears throat> chapter 1 and verse 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so are we with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Verse 6, be strong and courageous. 
Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. Verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. You get the feeling, you get the impression that here is a young man who's not absolutely brimming full of youthful courage and uh, enthusiasm. He's fearful of what lies ahead and he has to be reminded again and again to be courageous because the Lord is with him. Do you need courage? Do you need courage? Look to Joshua. Look to the mighty things that he accomplished. And then take a note of how that was done, because the Lord is with him. Do you need wisdom? Think of, think of Solomon. <clears throat> Here is Solomon, David's son, who is charged with the responsibility to build the temple, greatest building uh, 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 project that's ever been undertaken in the world to that point. And he needs wisdom to deal with that. And, he, and the Lord says that he will be with him in that as well. Remember that. You need wisdom facing up perhaps to decisions you need to make. Remember that. Wisdom is from the Lord. You need practical help. You need to know that the Lord will indeed be with you in the changing circumstances of your life. In Isaiah 41 and in verse 17. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Here's a promise of practical help and of spiritual help. You know, when you're parched with thirst and you need water now, when that's the case, rain in days past is no comfort. Long-range weather forecast is no comfort. You need the rain now. When the cupboard's bare, you need supply now. When the supermarket shelves are stripped bare, you need supply now. When you're laid off from your job, you need supply now. That's the promise. The Lord will provide for his people. The assurance the Lord provides. Miraculously, the Lord has provided for his people in times past. And the, the, the account of the widow with the, the, the oil and the time... Oh, Elisha, the oil that never ran out. That was a miracle. But in the ordinary providence of God, you see his hand at work as well. The psalmist could say, I have been young and now I am old. I can say that now. It's good. You know? I have been young and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous nor his children begging for help. Do you need help right now to go on? Practical help. Perhaps physically. But certainly spiritually as well. It's hard going. The heavens seem as brass, your tongue is parched, and you can hardly even pray. What does that mean? Does that mean the Lord has abandoned you at last? No, that's impossible, because I, the Lord God of Israel, will not forsake them. Friends, these promises are for all of God's people. That's why the writer to the Hebrews tells us that God has said these things, and we were put in mind of these examples in time past, and then that's applied to ordinary believers facing the challenges of life, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. That's why we read these things. That's why we remind ourselves of these things. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. Because all of God's children are his favourite children. All of God's children are his favourite children. Jacob and Moses and Solomon and the widow. And you and me, by the grace of God, are his favourite children. There's a tremendous value, therefore, in our giving our testimony of how the Lord has dealt with us. To be able to say, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him. Yes, it was far greater value by far in seeing how the Lord's promises have worked in the lives of his people that are recorded in his work. Time is slipping away from us rapidly, so some homework. What I was going to finish with is... The context in which this promise is given. Because extraordinarily, it says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have because you see. Keep your life free from the love of money. It's an amazing thing that to, to some poor, struggling, suffering first century believers facing persecution, facing the plundering of their goods, that they still they should be told, keep your life free from the love of money. It's a practical exhortation. The love of money is a sneer. The love of money is covetousness, and covetousness is idolatry. You see how this works? You love God and you trust His Word, or you love money and you live independent of God's Word. 
If this needed to be spoken as a warning to first century believers who were facing persecution and the plundering of their goods, it's certainly so for us as well. By comparison, we are fabulously wealthy. We've got wealth that a first century Christian couldn't imagine. We've got wealth that billions of people in the world today couldn't possibly imagine. Yes, including three ply conveniently presented to us in roles. Fabulously wealthy we are. If the writer can say to people who are having their property planted to keep their lives free from the love of money, we need to sit up and take notice. You can love money when you've got a heap of it and you want to keep it close, or you can love money when you've got none of it and dream of making it big. You can love money for its prestige and for its power. The wise way is it's a destructive master. No, be content with what you have. And what's the secret of contentment? I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know what it is to be brought low. I know how to abound. And in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Contentment. Content. In the presence of God who has promised never to leave us nor abandon us. And the believer can say, yes, that has been my experience. You can look back on your own life and you can say it's true. I am living proof of the promise. I've limped and I've stumbled and I've fallen, but I've been picked up and I'm still in the way. My failings, my sin have not caused him to leave me. I was full of sin when he found me. That's why he took me to himself. And that sin that continues to cling to me is not going to cause him to leave me now. Nothing's going to cause him to leave me now. Yes, and the troubles and the griefs and the darkest nights have not overwhelmed me. We can say with Samuel, till now the Lord has helped us. Well, yes, and because the Lord has helped us in time past, we know he will continue to help us. Friends, we can face the future, whatever the future may be, the confused future that's in front of us right now, we can face this with confidence that the Lord is with us and will never forsake us. Hold on to that. Look out for one another. Show in this way that indeed we believe the promises of God and we want to live by them. May God encourage us in the way. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We bless you for its sure and certain promises. We thank you that every promise of yours is yes and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we look to you in, the, in all the ignorance that, that we have, all the confused thoughts that go through our minds at this time, Lord, with all of the anxieties that are coming upon the whole of society. We look to you, our Father, as the one who gives us grace to help in time of need. We look to you, our Father, who give us opportunities to serve. We look to you, our Father, that you will lead us on in your service and make us to be a blessing to one another and to the community around us, that our Lord Jesus Christ might be held in honour in our midst. We ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat>